Good morning, my name is Michael Dallaire. My background is in production horticulture and today I'm here to talk about planting trees and tree and shrub care. When you're preparing your hole, uh, you want to dig a hole as wide as you can. The recommendation on our, our label says twice as wide, but you can go three times, four times as wide, you know, as big as you and as wide as you can go. Um, you don't, it's not really about depth. Uh, we have a high clay table here, so you're not going to get roots that really want to grow into that clay all that much. So just as deep as the root ball. I'm going to put a little shrub here. Um, so this shrub here, uh, we probably, at a minimum, we want to go out to here and really just as deep you don't want to bury this crown at all so the first step is dig that hole to that proper dimensions lay that shrub down in the hole nice and straight and you really want to rough and loosen that root ball this is now this root ball is not too bad it's already fairly loose but with some of these trees They've been in the pot so long that the roots are just going to go around and around and around and around and around. If you, don't, if you don't cut that root ball or loosen that root ball, the roots are going to keep doing that. And in five years time, if the tree is not dead, uh, basically it's going to be the same size. Or it's going to be bonsai or stunted. Um, so it's very important that we loosen that root ball. Uh, Secondly, preparing your, uh, your media, that's what's going to go back into the hole. Now, you'll hear different uh, opinions on this, this amendment. Uh, really in our soil though, since it is so heavy with clay, I usually recommend going three quarters native soil. So what you pull out of the ground and about a quarter compost. Um, I don't recommend adding peat or anything of that nature but something like a sea soil or a hops compost is a good amendment. So about a quarter of this to three quarters what you dig out of the ground, mix it together evenly from top to bottom uh, so it's consistent throughout the hole. Another thing when you're preparing your hole is that when you dig down with the spade the back side of the spade will actually compact this side of the hole here. It's not a bad idea to use something like a, some sort of gardening tool to just kind of scarify that kind of the edge of that hole. That will make it easier for the roots to kind of get out into that native soil, which will be key. Now, as for fertilizing uh, trees and shrubs for the first year, I've always recommended going with uh, Mike. And Mike isn't so much a fertilizer as a symbiotic root fungus. Uh, what, it, what it does is it colonizes the root system and they form little colonies on these roots and they send out their little mycelium or fungal hairs out into the soil and they're actually able to penetrate deeper and further out than the, the shrub or tree's roots will and they can draw on moisture and nutrients that the tree would otherwise not have access to. Uh, it actually will improve the survival rate of your trees and shrubs by about 75 percent so it's you know a very useful product to use. Now you can use a fertilizer in conjunction with Mike although we usually you want to have a lower middle number something that's below a, sorry <laughs> below a 20. A uh, high phosphorus will actually burn the mycorrhizae and make it ineffective. So we usually recommend like a transplant fertilizer or something like uh, or even a potassium rich fertilizer like Rage just to give it a little bit of an extra boost. Um, 
Now, my general rule of rule with caring for trees and shrubs in their first year in particular is that you want to pamper in the spring and then you kind of want to leave them alone a bit in the fall. Um, so I recommend irrigating usually every seven to ten days depending on the plant. So, but when you do irrigate, irrigate nice and deep, soak it well. Uh, with our clay soils, water tends to have a shallow, shallow penetrating, like it doesn't go very deep if you just gush it on. So when we get a heavy rain, most of that rain just runs off the surface because there's just the soil can't take the water in quickly enough as it's coming down. So you're better off using something either like a drip irrigation system, uh, something like a soaker hose or in this case like a tree watering bag um, and what this will do is it will allow you to get that water down nice and deep slowly uh, over a period of time and the general recommendation is about half an hour to 45 minutes um, this bag here will release uh, water over a six to eight hour period so it will allow the water to get down to that 18 inches that 20 inches where you need it to be um, other than that, you don't want to uh, overwater either. So going out, you know, it's very dependent on conditions. But if it's nice and warm like today, and it's like that for a week, you might water twice a week. Um, but for the most part, I'm recommending about once a week. Other than that, we also have, now that's another, if you decide not to go with the mic route, or with this transplanter, you can just go with a 1052-10 starter fertilizer. And that will give you the phosphorus, that middle number needed for root development. Other than that, going in, you know, going into the fall, how we should be caring for that is starting to wean off the watering. Once these soft tips start to harden or lignify, and they become woody. We want to cut back on the watering and kind of let the plant harden up for winter. Uh, the exception would be, is particularly with evergreens, sometime in September, just as the trees are starting to go dormant, give all your trees and shrubs a really nice deep soaking. That's going to build up the in plant reserve of water for the winter. Usually, what will kill uh, plants like this evergreen here in our climate is not so much the cold but desiccation over that long winter that six to eight months of cold dry air uh, especially when it's exposed to wind or sun over that period they just can't drop moisture from the ground and so by March or April their bone and crisp be dry um, now for other tree care products we you know we do have pruning paints pruning paints they're recommended in circumstances now where the wound is not going to heal over on its own so if you have a branch that breaks in a windstorm and it peels right down the side of the trunk and you have a large gaping wound uh, that's where you want to use pruning paints if it's where you're just doing little snips here and there and you're making proper cuts then it won't be necessary because the tree will do it on it by itself. Um, other than that, we do have staking systems as well. We both have the, the six foot metal stakes and uh, this is a mass system. With staking trees, it's usually not recommended that you have the stake on the tree for more than a year. And if it can support it, if it's a sturdy tree with a good root ball, you might not need a stake in the first place at all. Um, if you do need a stake, however, where you want to have your guidelines or your stake is out past the, the planting hole on the windward side of the tree. So typically we'll have like a northwest wind in Calgary, so you want to plant it on that north side and have a little bit of slack in the line, something that will just catch the tree and kind of hold it in place but not hold it too firm that it, it can't build that strength. It does need a bit of sway in the wind to build that strength.
Um, uh, one of the more important things in our area that you don't really see people doing is uh, tree wraps. Uh, tree wraps really help protect against the phenomenon known as uh, sun scald, particularly in the winter and spring months. So these, uh, basically on younger trees, they have a very thin bark. And what ends up happening in the winter months and the early spring is the sun is low in the sky and it heats up one side of the tree, whereas the back side of the tree stays fairly cold. So you typically see this occur on like the south or the southwest side of the tree, but what ends up happening is during the day that side of the tree heats up and then at night we freeze down again and the expansion and contraction of the cells in the tree causes the, those cells on the one side to die and split open and crack open. So it's very common on trees like aspen trees, Bill, and they usually start to develop cankers, which is like infections uh, on that side of the tree, and it eventually can kill the tree or over the course of years, or you'll get die back on that one side. It's very, very common. What tree wrap does is it reflects the sun's rays off the trunk of the tree and kind of keeps it cool on that one side, uh, protects it. Um, once the tree's been in the ground for two or three years and it's started to develop a corky bark, that bark actually becomes quite thick. And those, the living cells are further in as opposed to exposed near the surface. And they're less likely to have that problem. So you can remove the wrap after a few years. Other than that, it does take about two to three seasons for a tree or shrub to establish, depending. Some are quicker than others. Swedish Calmer Aspen, for example, will fast grows like that. They'll establish in about a year or two. Whereas uh, slower growers like cedar, uh, they, if they take, can take three, four years before you start to see any sort of significant growth off those, those trees or shrubs. Um, and other than that, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Like well, if we're getting a prolonged Chinook period, and especially if we had a dry fall with very little moisture, then I would say, especially in exposed sites, it's not a bad idea in my opinion, because it, those, what's, in, what's happening in those periods is they're slowly losing moisture through their, their needles or their exposed leaves. Um, with deciduous trees, that moisture tends to be locked up in the bud, so it's not a, as, they're not as exposed. But even spruce and pine, which are typically very drought tolerant trees, they can, you'll start to see it like in a two week Chinook period, if we're getting those warm temperatures, you'll see the burn on the tips of the needles, especially up further on the, the tops of the plants. And usually if you're giving them a really good soak in the fall, they'll have, you won't see as much of that. But yeah, if we're getting prolonged Chinook, I would say go ahead and do that. They won't break out of dormancy, it takes, it, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, sorry, I was just wondering, once I've mixed uh, the soil that I'm going to be putting back in around the tree, am I just going for a hand pack? Like, or is that going to settle over time? Or... I, I always let my soil settle with the watering. Um, you don't want to, a healthy soil will have air and moisture pockets in it. The plants need to be able to breathe um, respiration. So they pull in oxygen for the mitochondria during uh, respiration. And so it's a very important process. And the tree can actually, if it's too compacted here, they'll just shut down or die out altogether. So I usually, when I'm backfilling my hole, I do it gradually and I water as I backfill the hole. So I'll fill up to about halfway to the top with soil or my soil mix. And then I'll give it a light watering 
and then I'll top it right up again. And I'll bring it right up to here, and then I'll water it in, and it will settle over time. Um, if your soil is really, really bad, and you only have that much topsoil, only a few inches, I would probably even consider doing a mound and bringing that root ball up a bit and mounding it. Um, as opposed to the well system that you often see, that's meant to trap water, but it can also be uh, detrimental in the, in the sense that it can create a bowl in the clay where the water collects and then you have drainage problems. So you gotta be a little bit careful with that too. So I prefer if you do mound it up a little bit, so kind of bring it out, mound it up, do a little bit of a raised bed. And if you want a well, just have a slightly or higher edge of soil further out. Um, and that reminds me of something that's with regards to watering. Uh, initially, you're watering around the base. But over time, you really want to start directing that water more out towards the drip line. And that's the case with fertilizers as well. Your feeder roots are going to generally be out towards the edge of the root ball or the drip line. Uh, whereas your structural roots or the roots that hold the plant in place are towards the base. So when you're watering, try to water ar around here as opposed to right around the base. That way you'll avoid rot around the trunk and you'll kind of help tease those roots out a little bit. Encourage them to grow out here and like that as opposed to in this dense ball. Um, in our area as well, you, I would highly recommend that you put down a mulch of some sort. Now mulching, what it does, it helps moderate the soil temperatures. So it keeps them cooler during warm days and a little bit warmer during cold days. So you don't get the same temperature fluctuations in the root zone. And that's usually where we're gonna run into problems with trees and shrubs. It's not so much up here, but down here with the roots. Um, now, when you're mulching, you don't want to mulch right up against the crown too deeply. Maybe enough to hide the soil, just for aesthetic appeal. But you really, it's out here, and it's meant to protect the roots in that, that section. And you'll typically, in a clay soil, I recommend two to three inches. No more than four inches. If you have a landscape fabric down, certainly I would be on the two inch range um, and no more. Uh, just so it doesn't, it's just so the plant can breathe. Um, if you are putting down like a bark mulch, another thing to take into consideration is adding a slow release fertilizer that has a bit of nitrogen in it. Nitrogen is uh, the first number on a fertilizer container. So something that's a, like a granular. And the reason for that is uh, the carbon in the mulch actually can tie up nitrogen in the soil um, for a short period of time. The microbes ingest nitrogen to uh, compensate for the added carbon from the mulch. So by adding a kind of a slow release nitrogen based fertilizer, you kind of take that, take that into account so you don't get a, a nitrogen deficiency in the plant. I find that most people tend to overplant trees and shrubs. We, you know, we want it to look dense and thick right away. Um, but you know, even like a medium-sized tree, that's going to be about a 15 to 20-foot tree in our region. Uh, and it, yes, it does depend on the tree and what application you're using it for. But most urban lots these days, the smaller urban lots, will allow for a tree in the front and a tree in the back. 
and then otherwise you're looking mainly at more so towards shrubs to fill it in. Uh, for most, like a medium sized shrub, I would be looking at you know five to six feet apart, whereas a lot of trees you would probably be looking more at 20 feet, 15 to 20 feet apart if you can. Something like a Swedish Calm or Aspen or Calm or Juniper or something of that sort if you're trying to create a screen, they can go closer uh, five to six feet again. Um, but that's, that's, that's a good question. How does the um, cutting back on the fall watering work for fruit trees? Well, with fruit trees, uh, as, as far as like fruit sets concerned, yeah. So they're actually, when they're setting fruit, there are, they are more active than your typical deciduous tree. So you won't cut back as much. Uh, you'll keep them on a regular schedule up until harvest. Soon as you harvest, probably September, uh, August, at that point, then you would start cutting back altogether. Uh, but they remain active longer uh, just because of that fruit set. A lot of, I know with quite a few uh, apple trees, for example, well, September Ruby, they're biannual producers as well. So you'll get years where they'll, the tree will take a break and you won't get that many apples at all. And then the following year, you'll get a whole bunch, depending on if the flowers get caught by frost or not. Uh, so yes, you, you want to maintain a regular watering cycle on a, so every seven to 10 days, a nice deep root watering around the drip line of the tree. Uh, so, good question, yes. Um, now, another thing with the watering is, you know, it's nice to kind of have that schedule, but that doesn't always work out. With the week we just had and the rain we just had, I would probably skip this this week unless it's just a fresh transplant. Um, what you can do if you're unsure is just take a spade and check six, six inches down just outside the root ball. And if there's moisture in the ground, hold off for another day. And part of the reason why you want to water infrequently as opposed to every day uh, is because you want to train the root system to grow a little deeper. Uh, roots in the first two inches of the soil zone are very exposed to Chinooks. Uh, they're very exposed to cold, especially with our lack of snowpack. So really you want to encourage root development a little lower down, kind of in that six to 12 inch or deeper if you have the topsoil. Uh, and that will make the plant more drought tolerant and more winter hardy going forward. Um, now, as for fertilizers in the, their kind of their second or third year, you want to start looking at, in the spring, higher nitrogen fertilizers like a 30-10-10, and that will encourage leaf and vegetative structure development, so it'll make the plant bigger. Um, and then, but I limit that to one or two applications, an application in May and maybe an application in June. Uh, at that point, you want to wean them off the fertilizers and cut back, uh, just so they, these shoots can lignify and harden up, and and so they don't break a secondary bud. With our short seasons, you don't want that, just because it tends to get caught by our September frost or even an August frost. Um, other than that, if you do feel like if you have a stressed plant. Uh, going, especially going into winter, consider putting in uh, a high potassium fertilizer with zero nitrogen. Something like the Rage, which is a 006, or the Murate of Potash. And what potassium does is it's uh, basically a plant fortifier. It'll make it more resistant to insect pests by making the cell walls thicker and stronger. And it will also make it more resistant to uh, winter injury uh, and it will reduce stress in the plant. Something like a rage won't encourage active growth so it will allow the plant to still go into dormancy in the fall which is what you want 
but it will just help me keep the plant healthy, reduce stress going into winter. Uh, you can really plant at any time. You know, the, I generally, if you're planting an evergreen, I recommend uh, the spring uh, or the early summer, but you can plant right through until September even, as long as the ground is workable. Even deciduous trees that are dormant, uh, just make sure you water them in. So wintering in would be really there are the first winter. There are certain plants that you would probably, you know, you kind of, you, you harden them off for starters. So you ease off the watering, ease off the fertilizer, allow them to harden up. You water in in the fall so they have that implant reserve of moisture. But something like, for example, this yew, in the first winter, I would probably consider, you know, doing a burlap screen uh, just to protect it from the wind and sun over winter. You don't want something that's hugging the plant because what that will do is actually uh, exacerbate winter injury because it wicks moisture right out of the plant. You want it out and you want it open top. You, the plant still needs to be able to breathe. But what the burlap's doing is not keeping the plant warm. The plant's not producing any heat. Uh, what it's doing is it's keeping the sun off the foliage and it's keeping the wind off the foliage. So it reduces desiccation or drying out. Um, and that's, you know, even for the hardier evergreens in particular, even if you're planting a spruce or a pine or a juniper, that's not a bad idea for the first winter, at least until the plant's established. It might not look great, but uh, you know, down the road it's worth the effort. Uh, it, just because it, they are coming from the nurseries out in BC, generally speaking. So you kind of want to, it takes a while for them to adapt to our local conditions. Okay. A, a lot of people are planting like Swedish Columar Aspen, Tower Poplar, uh, because they're tall, narrow, they grow quickly. Um, it's not a bad idea. They'll give you a screen quickly, give you that privacy quickly. The one thing you, you do have to watch out for, generally speaking, when we have a lot of one uh, species or variety planted, all those trees are essentially genetic clones of one another. So they, when you do have a disease or a pest introduction into that area, you, you tend to, it spreads rapidly and you get a lot of die back in that particular type of tree. So I, I always tell people consider planting different varieties of trees so you have that diversity. So if bronze leaf disease becomes a real big issue, for example, with Swedish columnar aspen, it doesn't wipe out all your trees at once. You lose one or two trees as opposed to all of them. Uh, so consider having a mix. If you do decide to go with a, a denser planting, you can do that. Um, down the road, you might have to look at tree removal. Uh, you might lose the form of the trees. That might not be an issue for some people. Um, so instead of having that nice round crown like you would get on a royalty crab apple, it might be skewed to one side because they're going to kind of grow with their competition and try and out and out compete one another. But if it's for privacy, that might be what you're looking for. Uh, I, I think uh, it would be over. Okay, so you, you would be probably looking at a tower poplar. That will be one of the trees that will give you that height. Uh, grow quite quickly. Uh, consider mixing it with Swedish columnar aspen as well. So you have a little bit of diversity there. 
Um, you can also look at columnar blue spruce would be another one slower going with that tree but yeah. um, any other questions Yes. Can you shake the top to straighten it out so it doesn't just fall? It'll be difficult at that stage. Yeah. Um, the tree will, can probably continue in that growth pattern. If it's one thing you could try doing is, is there any other trees growing like on that, that other side? Is it sh a little shadier on that side? Uh, no. No, it's just kind of wind. Yeah, wind blowing so a little bit. Yeah, that would I would probably recommend against that. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's kind of the character of the tree. In that case, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's it probably just keep growing in that pattern. You could try doing some terminal tip pruning. So uh, the terminal tips, you head them back in and that will encourage the laterals to break out of dormancy and will give it kind of a thicker appearance. That's more, that becomes an annual maintenance uh, from year to year, but that's really, the, the staking I don't think would be effective in that case, yeah, unfortunately. Um, Do you have uh, an existing tree? Last owners leveled the lot and destroyed a lot of the root structure. So it's been failing for snakes. Um, some of the branches have started exploding too, and I'm not sure if that's oh. disease or if that's. They're kind of like the bark splitting open? Exactly. Okay. Um, what you can do if you, if you have root damage like that, consider compensating. Uh, with the vegetative growth up top. That's, if you get dieback like that, the trees generally, it's compensating for root loss because the root system cannot, can no longer support the canopy it once had. So that dieback is kind of just a natural process. Uh, prune out the dead wood uh, to begin with. See what the tree structure looks like if it still has a pleasant shape to it, uh, then if not, I'd consider removal and replacement. And quite often, if you do have a tree that is heavily diseased, damaged, and it's really sick, rather than it being an incubator for pest and disease, looking at the city here, uh, you got to consider removal. Uh, that's oftentimes the best, best option replacement at that point. Um, there are, if it's a minor outbreak of aphids, or if it's a minor outbreak, those, those things are okay. You're going to have, you know, you're going to have leaf spots, you're going to have blemishes on your tree. Uh, hopefully, you know, the natural systems at bay will keep them in check. Um, if it does get it to infestation levels, you can consider putting down pesticides at that point. But consider all your options as well. Especially if you have a yard full of trees, uh, then, then. Uh, the watering tank. Yes. The yes, these here use them for probably maybe the first two, three years. Um, it, no point putting it on a large caliper tree, because again, their canopy is going to be way out here. You're just going to be collecting water around the base or the structural roots of the tree. And the tree doesn't necessarily want that. Uh, well, first two years, I would use it. And I would fill it up once or twice a week at the most. It holds 20 gallons. And that's kind of, from what I've read, that's what you need, about 20 gallons a week for a, a fresh transplant. It does depend on the species of tree, though. Mm -hmm. It has all the inspections on like, how much for how much storage. Yes, that's correct. So um, you no, know, you can use you can use a small amount of it uh, on, and it will colonize over time the entire root ball. Uh, their recommendations are just 
for getting that whole root ball covered and colonized within that season. It also gives you a, a five-year warranty on the, the tree. So that's a one-time kind of replacement that you get a credit for the plant and then you can come in and pick out a different tree or shrub or and uh, get, it's kind of where it's a risky climate to plant in and so we understand that here at Greengate and so we give people that opportunity we take on some of the risk ourselves by offering that warranty so that's the it's sometimes it's you can do all the right things and it just doesn't take um, and that takes me, you know, when you're buying a tree and shrub, feel free to pull it out of the container, look at the roots, have a, you know, make sure it's a solid root ball, make sure there's roots there, give it a, a little bit of a shake, uh, and if you don't feel comfortable with that particular tree or shrub, we'll have another one here that will suit you. Um, so it's really, it's starting off with a healthy plant is also pretty pretty important in that case so it, and if you have the root system really is more important than anything else the leaves they get beat up in a hailstorms frost and they'll get spots on them but what you really want to be looking at is the stems and the roots and that's how, what's going to tell you how healthy that plant is Well, I hope that was beneficial and useful. I wish you guys the best of luck in the future.